Anti-Semitism is implemented in a significant uh, part of the society. Sometimes I feel withdrawn. I don't feel so much comfortable in the society. I feel I'm not accepted. So when I get bored, I think I'm thinking that today is the last day that I'm going to be in Germany. Or it's protest in Budapest in years. I'm here with David, a 23-year-old Jewish Hungarian. He's one of the three young people I and my fellow reporters will meet during the show. Three people who face discrimination. Uh, look, it would be good if you would like uh, record them because they are like the far-right people standing on the other side of the street. We're not here long before a group of neo-Nazis turns up on the scene. I don't know if they are really here to protest for the freedom of the internet. Probably they just want to provoke. As you heard before, like, he just shouted Jidok, which means Jews. So uh, yeah, probably they want to provoke a bit at the people. How, that, how does that make you feel like when you see that? I'm, I'm afraid of the future of the country. And I'm afraid that it's like, uh, instead of tolerance, uh, we are talking about hate and what you, you hear. That this, this demonstration has nothing to do with the Jews, nothing to do with anything, but he was shouting Jews. The protest is supposed to be about the new internet tax, but more than 10,000 Hungarians are here to vent their general frustration with the government. But if the revolution is starting and people go in, we go in with them, okay? okay good. David is surprised and happy that so many people have turned up to make their voices heard. But this enthusiasm turns into disappointment when the thugs show up again. I don't think that the demonstration should end like this. Uh, like in, my, in the ideal world, I think it's like it would be the still the whole crowd is coming here and they have a silent protest and not uh, breaking windows or chanting against Jews or gypsies. Where do you think is this, is this all going to? I don't know. It's like I have plans to leave, but it's still my home and uh, my hometown. I don't know. But I, I have like strong intention to leave, but I can't tell you which, which is going to be stronger. Who are you stuck with? Here in Berlin, I meet two young people who've already left their home countries. Ali and his friend Mohamed say they didn't have any choice. We're here to see an exhibition of photos, selfies taken by other refugees who fought to stay in Germany. However, most of them were deported. <laughs> Ali and his friend recognized some of them. This place became a symbol for refugee protest across Germany and their struggle for acceptance. For over two years, a group of asylum seekers camped out on this spot before they were evicted by the police. Over the years, the number of refugees coming to Germany has continued to rise. But only about 20% get to stay. Ali is afraid he'll end up like the other 80%. But in any case, the moments are really difficult. The moments are only one. The moments that a person feels like the whole world has been lost. And there is no other way to stay in the middle of the sea. I myself said that when I wake up, I don't want to go to sleep at night. Or when I wake up at night, I think that the day that I wake up is the day that I wake up at night. I think that the day that I wake up Ah, 
The Jewish community has always been an essential part of Hungarian society. These days, as has been the case in the past, they're the targets of growing anti-Semitism. To avoid confrontation, many Hungarian Jews prefer to live in a kind of bubble, David tells me. But it seems almost impossible to escape anti-Semitism even here in the Jewish quarter. Would you find that often? Yeah. Yeah, but we don't consider swastika as uh, anti-Semitic incidents because it's not uh, directly against Jews and there is uh, too many of them. So it's no use to deal with them. David watches out for anti-Semitic signs and slogans online and here on the streets of Budapest. And he leads a group of volunteers. They meet up at the Israeli Cultural Institute where they work on their Facebook page, the Forum Against Anti-Semitism. They collect and post acts of cyber hate and present a regular report to the community. I'm surprised at how well David and his friends seem to take it. But there are cases that really upset him. As you can see, it says uh, on the wall that is the Jews are rats. And this is a kindergarten and he is a father. And uh, it's, he published it on his own Facebook page. I find it really sad because like, this is a place where little children go uh, every Every day, and this is if this is their, their environment. Kim on. Kim on. Our third story takes me to Nairobi. I'm on what could be the girliest street in the whole city. It's one hair salon after another. I'm here with Leonida. If it weren't for her, I'd be the only Muzungu far and wide. That's what they call white people here. Unlike me, though, Leonida isn't European. She's 100% African. She was born and raised here in Kenya. Leonida was born with albinism, a rare genetic condition that means she doesn't have any pigment in her skin or hair and has trouble seeing. Secret combination. <laughs> You're not wearing your natural hair color. Why do you prefer to wear darker hair? I, my natural color is too, bl too blonde, and then when it doesn't blend, to, blend well with my skin color or skin tone, so I like something different so that at least I can look beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some people even don't like to associate with people with albinism. So sometimes it's, you, you, try, you try to become friendly to someone, but someone pulls back. So if the society just accepts that albinism is just a condition and we are like any other person, then I'll be very much comfortable in the society. By now, Leonida is used to looking different and being treated differently. She hardly even notices when people stare. What does scare Leonida is open hatred when strangers call her names. Some have even threatened to kidnap her or murder her. No, I just can't leave the house just going outside. It's something that has grown in me since I was young. Whenever I want to go out, I have to tell someone where I'm going, what I, if I'll, sp I'll be spending there for how many days or for how, how long, then what time will, I, will I, I'll be coming back and who I'm, I'm going to see. Freedom of movement is something refugees in Germany also long for. This is the refugee center where Ali lives. Every night, Ali has to check back in here. The center on the farthest outskirts of Berlin. Some refugees have to live in sports halls, others live in flats. Hallo, Hallo wie geht's? Ja, gut. Alles gut? Komm wieder ja. rein. Ja, danke. Ali has been living here for almost a year and a half. He has to stay at the center while German authorities examine his application for asylum. And that could take several more years. Until then, he's not allowed to go to university or hold a real job. Okay, und wohnst du mit dem anderen? Ja, mit anderen Mann. Ja. Und er kommt aus Iran. Ah, okay. Und er kann äh, sprechen Persisch. Ja. Ah. Und ich auch. Ah, super. Und das ist sehr gut. Ja. <lacht> he tells me he was allowed to ja. help with the community project. 
It only paid one euro an hour, but it was enough to buy this smartphone. یه به خودم قبول دادم که اگه من سه ماه کار کنم یا چهار ماه کار کنم بالاخره میتونم به چیزی که حتی اقل شی شاید من بیارزش باشه واسه کسای دیگه ولی واسه من خیلی با ارزشه شاید بتونم بهش دست برسونم و مثل این میمونه که یک بچه یک آرزویی داشته باشه وقتی با آرزوش میرسه واقعا خوشحال میشه واقعا از ته دل امیدوار میشه و فعلا من با این گوشی یه امیدواری خیلی کوچولو گرفتم و میدونم که اگر توی آلمان بمونم شاید بتونم شاید نه حتما میتونم واسه خودم کسی بشم یا واسه جامعه خوب بتونم آدم مفیدی باشم Ali has been a refugee all his life He grew up in Iran raised by Afghan parents In Iran Afghans are excluded from society and face massive discrimination Ali says the police arrested him and his family twice just for being who they are ما الان 18 سال ما و توی 18 سال ما هیچ اسنادی ندارم که بگم من مال یک کشورم یا که هویت من مشخص شه و تا الان واقعا یک آدم بی هویتم و یک آدم بی هویت تو یک جامعه یا تو یک کشور فکر نمی‌کنم مثلا جای جالبی داشته باشه و دوست دارم که بالاخره یک جای محو... مشخص کنه که هویت ما چی هست Ali came to Germany all alone. At the time, he was just 17. With his family half a world away, it's up to him to navigate this new culture and country on his own. We're headed out west, to the village Leonida grew up in. It's a day's journey from Nairobi. Leonida only comes home twice a year to visit her parents and her niece, Melia. Leonida is the only one in the family with albinism. You see, I look like my dad or my mom. Yes, I also think you look like both, but I saw that you look a lot like your mom. But my dad is old, he has white hair. Leonida's parents own a farm in the village, but they haven't always lived here. The family was forced to move when Leonida was a child. Later, 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 later. <laughs> After their youngest daughter was born with white skin and fair hair, the family faced discrimination from their community. According to common superstition in Kenya, people with albinism are seen as a curse. When I gave birth to hospital, the nurses ran away because they thought me when my husband comes, he's going to beat me because eh, maybe I had gone about with a muzungu to get her. But when the, my husband came, in fact, it's abnormal for a, a, an African man to come and hold a, a kid and kisses. But he came and held her and kissed her. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like you, you had to worry more about her than the other children? She came with her friends. So the friends were telling me, no, this one is not a... She's not a white, she's not a Muzungu, she's an albino, she's an albino. So she could ask me, Mom, what is an albino? So I was telling her, albino is a very special kid. In fact, people like albinos, they want them to get, they want the, there's so many families who want to get albinos, but they don't get, so you are so special. And that one gave, gave her courage, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like Victoria. And who's that? Back in Budapest, David is working on his own way to find more courage. He takes me to his Krav Maga training. Krav Maga was invented by a Hungarian-Israeli martial arts trainer to defend the Jewish quarter against fascist groups in the 1930s. Today it's a popular self-defense method developed for the military in Israel and security forces worldwide. So why is it uh, important for you to do Krav Maga? If one day I will be attacked as a Jew in Hungary, that just gives me more confident and makes me more secure that I could defend myself. But uh, I also I, I, I also think that this is like, uh, like not, in, not in the first place and maybe not in the second. This is what Krav Maga actually teaches you, that you need to be prepared for any attacks and you need to uh, handle uh, every, every conflict. And the potential for conflict seems to be growing. More and more Hungarians support the neo-Nazi party Jobbik. 
It now has 20% of the seats in parliament. I asked for an interview with the Jobbik politician several times, but no one was willing to talk to me. It's pretty much expressed by the, uh, by the... I want to know how this far-right populist party can gain one out of every five votes in Hungary. But this is something I think a, a huge... After 2006, when the far-right uh, in Hungary became uh, more uh, coherent, more institutionalized and more strong, it was the moment when anti-Semitism uh, began to rise. So there is a, a clear political driver behind it. There, is, there was a crisis period, political crisis, even economic crisis, austerity measures and a new emergent political force, Jobbik, that could exploit the old, uh, these frustrations and name a specific outgroup, the Jews, and that they are the one who blame. I follow Ali to his German classes. They are a chance for him to get out of the dreary shelter and go into town. Just a couple of years ago, asylum seekers like Ali didn't have access to language courses. Ali says learning German is hard work. That's something I can identify with. It has been a big challenge for me too when I came here. The classes are a welcome distraction from Ali's constant fear he might be deported. Die Deutschen manchmal haben keine Ahnung, was die Leute durchgemacht haben auf dem Weg nach Deutschland oder in ihrem eigenen Land, wovon sie davon gelaufen sind. Weil manchmal sitzt man in der Ecke und hat Angst, auf die Leute zuzugehen, weil man so viel Schreckliches erlebt hat. Und das ist auch die Aufgabe der anderen, der deutschen Bevölkerung, auf diese Leute zuzugehen und ihnen Hilfe anzubieten. Visiting her former primary school brings back some painful memories for Leonida. Many children with albinism are placed in schools for the blind. Leonida got to attend regular schools. But that also meant she was always the one who stood out. Leonida remembers being harassed by other kids. They would pinch me to, to see if I could feel pain, or just beat me to see if I can cry. Or someone can prick me with something to see if blood will come out. And do you remember, as a child, did you already know that people with albinism were at risk of being killed? As a child, it wasn't there for killing for ritual purposes. But some communities, like the Maasai community, used to kill because it's not accepted in the society. And do you remember when you first found out about this? What you thought then? Yeah, I was in, in, in Maasai land. That's when a Maasai approached me and told me that I'm not supposed to be in the community, I'm a cast. I should, they should get rid of me and they should take, even they're not taking me to my parents, they're just going to take, get rid of me, then they'll tell my parents later. That's when now I started, I, 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 I thought that this could be dangerous, like I'm not safe walking around. In Africa, more than 130 people with albinism have been murdered over the past few years as part of brutal rituals. Witch doctors use their body parts to make charms that are believed to bring good fortune or wealth. Leonida says these stories are always in the back of her mind. Back in Nairobi, I meet Isaac Mora, Kenya's first member of parliament born with the condition. He's an advocate for the disabled and those who live with albinism. If somebody ever asks you, how comes you look like this? Just answer him or her, I am this or that way because of the image of? Yeah. 
You remember that blind man, Bart Myers? I want to know from him what makes the killings possible. There's a confluence of uh, uh, superstition, superstitious practices and capitalistic greed. Where people want to make money out of uh, uh, persons who are, uh, who are disabled, uh, who have a skin impairment. It's really sad. And if you look at what is causing these problems, again, it is superstition. It's about traditional beliefs. If you look at many of the, our, our Kenyan communities, they don't have a, a, a traditional name for persons with albinism. They don't. Black people are also racist. And we need to tell that. Because the way they treat people with albinism, it borders on racism. Growing racism is worrying many people here in Hungary. The Doani Street Synagogue in Budapest Jewish Quarter is the largest synagogue in Europe. In 1944, around 800,000 Jews lived in Hungary. By the year's end, some 560,000 had been murdered, most of them deported to concentration camps by the Nazis. David lost three of his great-grandparents during the Holocaust, but doesn't want to focus on the past. So you should, you should move on. This is like, uh, this is what is it's called history, because this is something that's happened in the past and you need to move on and maybe to to prevent that it wouldn't happen again. But the way is, is not to like to talk about it all the time. And what about your parents? Did they talk about that? And did they, did they talk to you about, uh, about Judaism, about being a Jew and about all the, the heritage? Uh, we actually never really talked about it in the family. But um, so they don't, anything say, they don't say anything directly, but they always uh, I felt like they, they were always trying to give me the, the impression that uh, like being Jewish is like it comes with being victimized. David's parents are not happy about their son becoming active in the Jewish community. They are worried because of what their family experienced in the past. But David and his friends are determined to oppose the growing anti-Semitism in their home country with a new generation's self-confidence. <laughs> Back in Berlin. The city trains can be a luxury means of transportation when you don't have enough money to buy a ticket. Ali is used to walking a lot around in Berlin. Twice a week, Ali comes to an even bigger refugee shelter to play football with the children who live here. He's their coach and their mentor. Like him, some of these children have experienced prejudice and discrimination from the time they could walk. They know that not everyone appreciates their presence here in Germany. Oh <laughs> ولی از طریق فوتبال خدا رو شکر الان نزدیک به 5 تا 6 تا یا بیشتر دوستای آلمانی دارم و ایرا میدونم که فوتبال باعث میشه که من بتونم کانتاکت بیشتری پیدا کنم و بتونم با جامعه آلمان بیشتر رابطه پیدا کنم Ali doesn't want to be considered just a refugee he wants to be accepted as a full member of society I'll be checking in with him again soon to see if he succeeds. Nighttime in Nairobi. This is when the city is most dangerous, especially for foreigners who might have money or people with albinism. Leonida only ventures out at night accompanied by friends. She also feels like she can't trust men anymore. My first boyfriend. I don't know whether he used to love me, I can't tell right now, but uh, he didn't really much appreciate me. Any time we are with him, we are just indoors. He didn't like to walk with me. When you are walking in the streets, 
he's walking some meters away from me. So it, I think he didn't want to, people to know that he's with me or people to think that he's associating with me. So when I saw that and I, I told him there's no point, then why are we dating? Uh, we just call this thing off. Since moving to Nairobi, Leonida has met others living with albinism. When she's with them, she gets to feel normal. But what she and the others really want is much more. They don't just want to be tolerated, they want to be loved and respected for who they are.